Welcome to Tokyo Wave, recorded in a live studio in Harajuku, Japan, with your hosts, Aaron and Parker. All right, everyone, welcome to episode 30 of Tokyo Wave. We are your hosts, Aaron Randall and Parker Allen. This week, we are joined by a special guest, Dr. Nancy Snow, global communication strategist, public diplomacy professor, opinion writer, and nation branding expert. On Tokyo Wave, we bring you weekly updates from our studio in Harajuku. Join us in segments featuring this week's top news, political happenings, business, and other random stuff. Here are this week's top news highlights. Japanese scholars submit over 140,000 signatures opposing the Prime Minister's Science Council decision. A record 96,000 households received Japan government support for rent amid pandemic. Aichi locals shocked as a cherry tree blooms in autumn. This week in Japan. Okay, here's our top news this week. Japanese scholars have submitted over 140,000 signatures opposing the Prime Minister's Science Council decision. The Mainichi reported that university professors demanding that the Japanese government retract its decision not to appoint six nominated scholars to the Science Council of Japan visited the cabinet office on October 13th. To deliver over 140,000 signatures collected in an online petition they launched against the government's move. In addition to the signatures, scholars submitted a letter of protest addressed to Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga, stating that the government's action was a violation of academic freedom and independence. The online petition was launched on October 3rd by Jun Suzuki. Professor of the Graduate School of Humanities and Sociology at the University of Tokyo, and Takahisa Furukawa, Professor of the College of Humanities and Sciences at Nihon University. The number of signatories has reached 143,691 as of October 12th. Oh, the humanity. The protest letter expressed a sense of crisis over the government's move, stating, The essential state that the Science Council ought to be in has been tremendously harmed, and it may cause damage to society. It was also critical of the government not providing a reason for the action, stating that condoning the issue by staying silent makes society as a whole feel stifled and could make the country liable to mishandling its future. After submitting the petition, Professor Suzuki commented, A substantial change in the government's interpretation of the law, like in this case, should not be undertaken without having discussions in the legislature. Next up, a record 96,000 households have begun receiving Japanese government support for rent mid pandemic. Kyoto News reported that a record 96,000 households in Japan have received rent support from the government due to falling incomes amid the novel coronavirus pandemic. About 109,000 applications for rent support were submitted between April and August, of which around 96,000 or 88% were approved, according to the Health, Labor, and Welfare Ministry. The number of approvals in the five months was already 2.6 times the fiscal 2010 total of 37,000. This was during the wake of the global financial crisis triggered by the 2008 collapse of U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers Holdings Incorporated. This assistance program originally targeted displaced workers, but the government relaxed conditions in April of this year to cover people whose incomes had fallen due to lost working hours amid the pandemic. To qualify for rent support, An applicant must have lost a job within the previous two years or incurred a decline in income for unavoidable reasons. Other conditions include they must have lower income and savings than predefined benchmarks and must be seeking employment. These income and savings benchmarks vary by the region and number of household members. For instance, 
A single member household in central Tokyo would qualify if their monthly income is no higher than 108,000 yen and their savings are less than 504,000 yen. Specific. Yeah, yeah. Can an individual qualify as a household? A single member household, yes. Oh, okay. Up to 53,700 yen per month can be provided to a single member household in central Tokyo for three months. With a possible extension to nine months. Monthly breakdowns provided by the government show over 44,000 applications were filed in May, and the government decided, as a result, in June to provide benefits to a record 34,000 households, apparently due to business closures following the imposition of the state of emergency, which occurred in Japan in April and May. The number of applications fell to 1,423 in July and then 9,379 in August, but remained at high levels. Since households can receive rent support for up to nine months, those who began to receive such aid in the spring will run out of support in the winter, possibly leading to increased homelessness in cold weather. This point was brought up by a support group who is calling on the government to extend the period of this provision to at least one year. Because it's not that bad being homeless in the spring. <laughs> wow, wow. So the government has also been urged to ease the benchmarks and other conditions so that more people can qualify for rent support. I mean, I think this is a great move.、Uh, we've seen this in many other countries as well,、uh, namely the one we're from. Uh, where the support hasn't been so great. So,、uh, you know, counting on Japan to、uh, maybe help out a little. Yeah, my only worry is, you know, rent support and related things are notoriously hard to obtain in Japan. And that's, of course, a problem that spans across all sorts of social welfare systems, including in other countries. But Especially, you know, people who go to receive government assistance to these local ward offices or city offices in normal circumstances are often discouraged or even turned away by bureaucrats who think they are basically bullshitting them in order to get free money. Right, right. So, right. I mean, my major hope is that the people in charge in these local offices during this pandemic are being a little bit more understanding of the circumstances that these applicants are facing. For sure. I can already imagine the application form 30 pages. <laughs> How many hunkos and fax machines are required <laughs> for that? Too many. And up next, Aichi locals shocked as a cherry tree blooms in autumn. The Mainichi has reported that a cherry tree beside the Yamazaki River in this central Japan city's Shikusa Ward, a popular viewing spot for the country's iconic cherry blossoms, has bloomed out of season. Some 20 cherry buds on the Somei Yoshino tree, which usually only flowers in spring, have bloomed. A city official in charge of managing the trees along the river said, I've never heard of these trees blooming during this season. The report mentions that many people stop as they walk nearby to take photos of the odd sight. Nobuyuki Niimi, secretary general at a local branch of the Tree Doctors Association in Japan, explained to the Mainichi Shimbun that. Well, it suddenly became warm after the temperature dropped, so I guess the tree might have mistaken that for spring. You know, these trees are pretty stupid. If the temperature drops, it'll become dormant again. Masami Hasegawa, a 79 year old who lives nearby, noticed a cherry flower blooming during a walk. He was deeply moved and said, I've lived,、uh, I've lived here for a long time, but it's the first time I've seen this.、Uh, this gives me energy. There seems to be some good things happening toward the end of this year. Hot damn. According to the Nagoya local meteorological office, temperatures of 25 degrees Celsius or higher have been recorded recently in Nagoya's Chikusa ward, with the maximum temperature reaching 28 degrees Celsius on October the 11th. Rain is forecast for the weekend, and temperatures are expected to drop. So, this isn't the first time this has happened. This happened two years ago.、Um, I don't know if you remember. I remember all over Instagram, people were posting.、Uh, I think there was a two day period of a heat wave, and all the cherry blossom trees started blooming again. 
It's like global warming is here, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen to Hanavi's? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, all I can say is I hope that someone took the initiative and whipped out that blue sheet because, uh, you know, what is it? Isn't uh, al fresco dining the most uh, pandemic friendly uh, way to fraternize with your buddies in this uh, interesting climate we find ourselves in right now? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Aaron. Yeah. Let's go do Hanami in Nagoya. Ooh, this sounds like fun. But we have to go right now. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs> no, we can't do that, can we? <laughs> no, no, unfortunately. All right, and up next, we have a special interview with Nancy Snow, global communications strategist, public diplomacy professor, opinion writer, and nation branding expert. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Dr. Nancy Snow is Pax Mundi Professor of Public Diplomacy at Kyoto University of Foreign Studies in Japan. In spring of this year, she held the Walt Disney Faculty Chair in Global Media at Tsinghua University's Schwartzman College. She is author and editor of 13 books on foreign policy, media and public relations, propaganda, and public diplomacy. Dr. Snow is known as a top authority on public diplomacy, nation branding, and propaganda studies with over 3,000 citations on Google Scholar. She has provided expert analysis to broadcast, print, and online media in over 600 interviews, including BBC News, ABC News, CNN, Australian Broadcasting, Canadian Broadcasting, Los Angeles Times, The New York Times, and National Public Radio Affiliates. Dr. Snow has been living in Japan since 2013 when she was invited by the Social Science Research Council's Abe Fellowship Program. Her 2016 book, Japan's Information War, is based on her research as a jolly good Abe Fellow. Dr. Snow is Emeritus Professor of Communications at California State University, Fullerton, where she played a central role in establishing the University of Southern California Annenberg School's Center on Public Diplomacy and the first Master in Public Diplomacy degree program in the United States. Dr. Snow is an alumna of the Presidential Management Fellows Program at the United States Information Agency. She received a PhD in International Relations from the American University School of International Service in Washington, D.C., so, Dr. Snow, thank you so much for uh, being on the show today. I'm blushing a little bit because you just went through my entire CV. <laughs> <laughs> We're real good at reading here on the Tokyo Wave. <laughs> <laughs> so, a, a funny fact for our listeners, all three of us are from the American South. Yeehaw, oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So, I'm Tennessee. Orlando, Florida. I'm Georgia. Georgia. Yes, but I didn't grow up there. And uh, I do have the Southern accent. My family moved away from there shortly after I was born. They took me with them. Let me be clear. <laughs> <laughs> but Thank you we, for clarifying uh, that. We did eventually return to the South. My dad's from Alabama. We um, So I spent the bulk of my time in the South in Richmond, Virginia, in Greenville, South Carolina. And I was a Clemson Tiger as an undergraduate. (laughs) That's my tiger growl. Yes, very good. I don't have any tiger blood. We should get, uh, who who is the tiger blood guy? Charlie Sheen. We got to get him on Tokyo Wave. Can I just tell you all that I used to sell my football ticket? (laughs) (laughs) And of course, we're number one. We're one of the best football programs in the country. But I would sell it for 20 bucks and that would cover my groceries for the week. I just thought that was so cool that I could what did you <laughs> take like, care of my... You just kind of s- s- were outside the stadium with some dark sunglasses and a trench coat. <laughs> Not exactly. I, I, can't, I can't recall because we weren't really doing things online then, but I, it went very easily. And then my sorority friends, because I was not a member of a sorority, they would then allow me to come sit with them in the stadium. So it was a blue light special. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, now Shout in America, out to blue Kappa light Alpha Theta. <laughs> <laughs> tend to involve the police, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, man. No, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, and I am back and uh, refreshed and have uh, taken care of my self-quarantine. You all know that I'm uh, uh, back to Japan after quite an extensive stay in the United States, if you haven't heard uh with the pandemic, it's a little bit difficult to get back. Yeah, uh, Nancy, that was one of the first things we wanted to ask you about. Um, so Parker and I have been reporting on, you know, all the news concerning foreign residents and their inability or inability to come back to Japan. And you just went through the whole process. So we'd love to hear your experience, uh, maybe even some tips, stuff to look out for. Yeah, it, it's difficult because it seems like it's kind of a moving target as far as what you need to prepare. But what I would recommend to people, you have to go through, more often than not, you're going to have to go through the local Japanese consulate, depending on your status. And so I went through New York State because I was at my home in Syracuse in upstate and they were wonderful, and they emailed me. You would uh, have to go in person in the old days. And so I was able to send them my passport, and point by point, they told me every document I needed. And so I had to get a new certificate of eligibility and a new work visa, no problem. But here's the kicker. Uh And of course, the negative COVID test, which you have to do within a window of 72 hours from Mm. the test results to wheels up on the airplane. So the it's a stressful thing to go through and you're you're not sure if you're going to be turned away. You don't quite know what to expect at the airport in Japan. But the kicker for me was that I was changing planes in Detroit waiting for the international flight to Japan. And the one ticket agent asked for a document that I was sure I didn't need. And so she was sure that I did need it. And she said, I'm not going to let you board the plane. And it was really minutes from takeoff. And we did end up departing late, which I have not confirmed, but I think I'm probably the cause of that. (laughs) And uh, she asked for a letter that was not in the bullet points that the Japanese consulate in New York had given me. And but she was busy because she was also taking tickets. And so I couldn't really engage with her for very long. Finally, she called for backup supervisors. They came over and I had uh, a very friendly conversation with them. And I said, I know I won't have any trouble getting into Japan. Um, Just please let me go, because if I have to return to New York, I've got to go through this process again, rebook the flight, take Mm. a new test. And so in the end, I thanked the woman agent. She was Japanese, but she was being very, very thorough. And I thanked her for her thoroughness. And, And I also at one point told her, that I was willing to take the risk because she said, I can't let you get on board in case you get there, they turn you away. You're going to have to pay full fare and go right back. And I said, I'm willing to take that risk. And you're feeling lucky. Yeah. Well, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) I was feeling confident because I had the email, I had a documentation The recommendation I would have, again, for all of our listeners out there is that you print that out because when you're kind of fumbling around and you're nervous and you're Mm. in shock to try to get that email, thankfully I was able to pull it up, but she didn't really even look at it. It was the supervisors who were wonderful. And I will say from, I I didn't say the airline, but I have no problem saying it was Delta Airlines. Oh, yeah. But they were great. Atlanta, Georgia based. (laughs) (laughs) So the, um, and they were, they were sort of siding with me because I was telling them, you know, I had nothing else to do for the previous five days, but to make sure that I had all my ducks in a row. Mm. And so once we landed, you do go through an immediate uh, second. COVID test. 
and then you wait for the results. And this was at Hanada, and we were, I, I just tried to be very relaxed. I had done a 10 day meditation retreat over the new year, which really helped me to keep everything in balance. So, uh, I said, do you, how long will this take? Because I had somebody waiting to give me transportation to my apartment in Tokyo. And the very kind, uh, person said it would be two to three hours to get my result. And, uh, but it actually was about 30 minutes. So I would say from the point of deplaning to getting my baggage, it was about two hours. Now, my worry is that if you add thousands of people, Hmm. I don't know if Japan is really fully prepared for this. And I just wrote an op-ed about this for Nikkei Asia, speaking of opinion writing, but I, the first draft was very personal, my own personal account. And then I just thought that's not really the point. The point has to be that it's one thing when you're dealing with a really small number, because there were a lot of people working at the airport And so you felt comforted by that. They were guiding you through the whole process. But I just picture a lot of foreigners returning and we're all stressed out. We've been away for months. It's a very uncertain time. And I just know that tempers are going to flare and you, you have to be really patient and just wait it out. And in the end, I was able to renew my residence card on the spot. That was a surprise. That that was like the cherry on top of this cake bomb. Cake bomb. <laughs> which it all which That's it, something that you're not well, supposed cake, to say at the airport. No, I know. <laughs> but I mean, after what I had almost gone through with the denied boarding. I thought I'm not going to have this nice surprise at the end, but I did. And on top of that was when we went to baggage claim, very Japanese style, the bags had been taken off, neatly placed on carts that were all lined up, just sort of easy go. And I loved it. I loved to see that. And I just felt like saying, oh, welcome me back to Japan. I was just so thrilled. I wanted to hug <laughs> Yoko people. Yoko-so but- to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And I wanted to do a dance when she brought my residence card because I said, you mean I don't have to go back to immigration, which uh, is not exactly the most uh, thrilling uh, sort of amusement park to uh, experience to have. Wow. Wow. No, congrats on getting through all of that. Oh my gosh. Um, Yeah. And as you said, you know, uh, and as me and Parker have looked into this, uh, the fact that you have to be tested multiple times before and after flying. I mean, I feel like it'd be so easy for someone to just have a high temperature, right? During one of these tests, just because all the stress that's going on. It's like, welcome to Japan. We will first test your zen like patience. <laughs> Please wait for sensei. It takes two to three hours. <laughs> you know, I have to admit, I did not know that we all, everybody getting off the plane, which might've been it. 25% capacity that we all had to be tested. So the Japanese returning, it wasn't like foreigners were just picked out. Mm. I thought it was going to be the temperature check and that if you were running a fever, then they would test you, but you really can't pass go with that, that test. And even if you've just had the test, you think, well, how does this work? Maybe, I mean, the the airlines are telling us it's very safe when you're flying. And I I did feel quite comfortable, but there's just that worry in the back of your mind. And one of my friends uh, put a notice up on Facebook and there was a picture of us together and there were already people asking me about, oh, you're back in Japan. What was your experience like? Because they figured that I would have to go to some type of interim hotel before, Mm. during the 14 day self-quarantine, because that's the other thing you go through. You give your email at the airport. And then after a few days, I started hearing from my local ward asking me to take my daily temperature and 
and uh, report it back to them. And but you, if you have your private uh, domicile here, you can just go straight home. But what happens to somebody who tests positive? I do you go straight to a hospital? I don't know how that works. Mm, they uh, tie you up and put you on a plane <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to Bali. <right. laughs> <laughs> but I also wonder with these airlines, what kind of training? It seemed like your immigration status was being determined by a ticket agent. Like they're taking your ticket to get on a plane, but they're also asking for all these documents. And I thought, oh my gosh, it comes down to this one woman where I've already left the first airport and had to show my papers there. So really it's your point of departure. That's where they should be the most careful because yeah, it's, then uh, it's kind of like an Ellis Island moment. But when you're leaving for Ellis Island, <laughs> <laughs> we're not even going to let you on the boat. <laughs> well, I mean, at least in, in New York, I would have been an Uber ride back to my home and to restart the process. But when you're at the second place and some flights back to Japan are going to be two stops or so, mm-hmm. That is really unnerving yeah, to go I, through that. And as much as I think it would have been great if you could experience the beauty of downtown Detroit. I love Detroit. <laughs> I love Motown. Don't get me started there. I actually flew from Tokyo to Detroit two years ago to see the Queen of Soul lying in repose. And that was my first time in Detroit. Oh, wow. So I'm a great the queen defender. Of soul for, uh, Detroit has it all. It has wonderful people. And we really bonded to, uh, uh, there was a line there. They were all local Detroiters. There weren't many people from out of town. And I even had shirts made up. You can go to Uniqlo. And I said, I flew from Tokyo, Detroit <laughs> to Detroit to see the queen. And I had a little <laughs> crown <laughs> So I still have those T-shirts. I don't wear them that often because they don't really make sense now. But <laughs> Well, for our listeners not familiar with the Queen of Soul, who are you referring to? Aretha Franklin. <laughs> so if you can't pass that test, then uh, I'm not sure if I want to talk to you. <laughs> Turn this off right now. <laughs> what is it? Uh, Prince Prince is also from Detroit, right? That's his hometown. Well, he would be the Minneapolis-St. Paul. Twin Cities area. Ah, okay. Yes. A bit different. <laughs> <laughs> so let's shift gears. So you've been in Japan now as a scholar and a very often cited commentator since 2013, but what's your history with Japan? My first trip to Japan, you mentioned the U.S. Information Agency. It was, uh, I was working during Bill Clinton's first term and it was the summer of 93, and I got an invitation uh, from the Japanese government, the prime minister's office. It wasn't so much a personal invitation to me, but it was to a small group of us from the agency to participate in a professional exchange called the International Youth Village, which is now defunct, but it was quite prestigious. And there were 150 of us from all over the world. And then we would spend, it was about 20 days. The last week we met our 150 Japanese counterparts. And it was like this mini model UN experience. And I just thought, what a lovely country, but I had no connection to Japan. And I did, though, uh, feel very strongly knowing the history of our two countries. It was very bizarre. I, I don't know if I write about this in Japan's information war, but I had this sense of urgency to apologize to the Japanese people, you know. And I remember talking to this uh, older lady, and and it, it was about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and she said. That was then, this is now. You know, she sort of just gave me this immediate forgiveness. It just put me at ease. And I thought, of course. I mean, I, I, I really do see now all these years later how intertwined, what an important 
binational relationship this is. And so I came here briefly in 93 and back for another professional exchange in 94 and then nothing until 2010 after Barack Obama had been elected and I got invited by the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo and the State Department where I used to work in Washington and they invited me to go around Japan to talk about Obama's Asia pivot because the worry was that Obama was focusing more on China and that Japan, this idea of Japan passing, Japan was sort of being forgotten a little bit. The relationship was being taken for granted, perhaps. So I went to all the American cultural centers and in the country, and it it was an extraordinary trip. I flew from Syracuse, New York, uh, to Okinawa in one day, I guess it was like a 24 hour, 30 hour period. And at, in Okinawa, I actually briefed, uh, public affairs reporters who, uh, do a lot of, uh, outreach with the U S military there, even though I was kind of there to be a expert on public diplomacy and, I learned so much at that time about Japan. And that was the epiphany for me to continue my journey with Japan. You mentioned that I've been here mostly full time since 2013. In 2012, I did a Fulbright at Sophia, your alma mater. But that was just one semester. And I thought that was going to be a one off. That was going to be the follow up to that trip around the country but indeed, what happened is that I fell in love with the country and I retired early from Cal State Fullerton to live in Japan. And so you came to Japan in 2013 as an Abe Fellow, correct? That is correct. And uh, shout out to the Abe Fellows Program, the Social Science Research Council. What I love about that experience is that it is research only. So it is such an indulgence for a scholar to drill down. The the program was the vision, or I guess it really came out of uh, Shintaro Abe's uh, um, speech uh, he gave in Washington, D.C. before his passing, the, the longest serving foreign minister for Japan and Shinzo Abe's father. And... Um, it's designed for Japanese scholars and American scholars to respectively spend time in each other's country doing research with the idea that we will help to build collaborative ties over time. And so I affiliated with Keio University, the Institute for Media and Communications, but again, non-teaching. So the entire time I was like a cultural anthropologist. I was just out observing everything I could about Japan, interviewing people using sort of a snowball methodology where you go talk to one and you... A snowball, say, <laughs> eh? <laughs> I, I'm not real strong in methodology, but I, I was told when I described the way I was meeting people, they said, oh, it's like you build on one after the other because I'd have my first interview... Uh, with at that time the executive director of the American Chamber of Commerce, and then I'd say, uh, Sam Kidder, I think it, I'd say, now who do you think I should go talk to next? And I think Robert Dujaric came out of that from the Institute for Contemporary Asian Studies uh, at Temple University, Japan. Jeffrey Kingston talked to a number of Japanese professors all of whom everybody I talked to uh, was speaking to me in English because I'm not, I've never studied the Japanese language. So again, I'm, I had the outsider eyes, but over time I could see these patterns. And when you don't speak the language of the country, you really are forced to use your other, other senses. And it makes you much more sensitive to the gestures and just the the, the behavior, the nonverbal behavior of people. And so from that, I, I published Japan's Information War, but I've also published so many articles and studies based on the Abe Fellowship as well. So I'm really indebted to them. Wow, that's just a, 
incredible background and incredible experience. Um, so, uh, were you into public diplomacy before Japan or after coming to Japan? Was that kind of your main focus? Yeah, public diplomacy really began for me when I worked at the U.S. Information Agency. So if you have not heard of USIA, I think overseas it was known as the U.S. Information Service. It's uh, It grew out of the Office of War Information. It was established as an independent foreign affairs agency in 1953. I didn't know much about it when I was finishing my Ph.D. in Washington, but American University really promotes the Presidential Management Fellows Program, which is an excellent management trainee program uh, for the federal service. And because of my international relations PhD, I w- it was suggested to me to apply to the State Department and the U.S. Information Agency. USIA, State Department makes policy, so foreign policy. That's where our diplomats are. That's like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. USIA was the open-sourced propaganda agency uh, affiliated, of course, with Voice of America, Radio Free Europe. And I worked in the Academic Exchanges Division, the Bureau for Educational and Cultural Affairs. We oversaw the Fulbright program. So I was the Fulbright desk officer for Germany, Spain, and, and I learned a lot about the bureaucracy working there. And we didn't use the term public diplomacy. That term has been around since the 60s. We used public information, but it's a euphemism for propaganda. But as I say, it's not the, um, it's open source. So it, it's really designed to say this is brought to you by the U.S. government, but it has propaganda sponsored purposes to it. So out of that, I published my first book in 1998, which was about my experience working at Bill Clinton's U.S. Information Agency. And that's called Propaganda Inc., selling America's culture to the world. And I'm laughing because it's now in a third edition and it's been published in several languages. It's my most successful book and it's my first book. Um, But I think it's because it really struck a chord with many global publics, people outside the U.S. who are on the receiving end of American propaganda. And so they were really curious about this story of telling telling America's story to the world, which was the motto of the agency. And um, I wrote a critical uh, account of the Clinton administration, because if you remember, this was post-Cold War. So at that time, the feeling, the sentiment in Washington was that everybody wants to be like the United States. They want the free market economy. And so we were doing a lot of training and outreach in the uh, former uh, Soviet uh, republics. Um, But indeed, what we also saw under Clinton was a rise of anti-Americanism, which, you know, ebbs and flows. And we're seeing that again, um, you know, all these years later, Bush years, we saw it too. So I, um, that's really what got me into public diplomacy. And then after 9-11, the whole field took off. It's a subfield of political science and international relations, but it became a real hot topic for a lot of young people who wanted to learn about that intersection of persuasion with information, media, and then you add all the social media coming along in this century. So it's just proliferated dramatically. You know, it's crazy. Even spending the last 14 years in Japan, I mean, I don't really remember people talking much about soft power or nation branding back in the mid-2000s, but now it's it's really part of the vernacular and especially in communications industry circles, everybody's talking about it. And it's something that we see a lot more of, especially with the rise of China's influence in public diplomacy and this notion of rising soft power superpowers. Absolutely. And I can tell you, even with Kyoto Gaidai, 
Um, I started out, I taught my first course there in 2016, and it was predominantly, it was American students. I had one Japanese student in there. And now I've got this growing uh, population of Japanese students because they've heard of soft power and they've heard of branding beyond just branding of goods and services to the idea of place branding and nation branding. And they're very curious about it. And that is the most fun for me is to introduce these young minds to this arena of interest, because I know at the end of my class, they're going to start noticing then a lot of the attributes of soft power. And of course, soft power came from Joseph Nye, uh, who's written a number of books about that. But you're, you're right, uh, uh, Parker, even post 9-11, it didn't take off as much. It, in, certainly not in Asia. China has poured money into public diplomacy, propaganda, the whole continuum <laughs> of persuasion. So Nancy, maybe you've already answered it in a way, but I mean, so where do you see the world um, heading in terms of who will be the soft power superpower moving forward? This is really difficult right now in 2020 because when the global pandemic was named such on March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization announced that if you look at the patterns, you see a a lot of sort of ultra nationalism. So we are seeing the countries, not regions, but countries really sort of dig in and take care of their citizens, put up some strict borders. So that suggests to me that nation branding and that competitive nation branding will be in play here. But as far as our future and really taking care of the planet, we have got to get beyond nation branding to regional collaboration and and not make this so much of a zero sum sort of winners and losers game. And because it's just a new day. I mean, if we can't learn from a global pandemic that's impacted all of us, uh, I don't know what else we can have as a teacher. But it's the idea of making connections now. We're certainly doing it online, digitally. That digital outreach will continue it's going to have its fits and starts. I much prefer face-to-face communication. And one of the foundations of public diplomacy, we often mentioned Edward R. Murrow, the very famous CBS News reporter who went on to head the U.S. Information Agency under Kennedy. He would talk about the last three feet of communication was so valuable. The idea of looking at somebody and communicating across the table Um, and we've lost a lot of that now, uh, but we can, we can reconnect if we really think in terms of a sort of multiplier effect that we have to shift our thinking and make connections, the human connection with the technology that we have in place. Although keeping in mind that there are so many who will be left behind who won't even have the electricity, much less the World Wide Web uh, there at their fingertips that we take for granted in the academic community. Those are some excellent points. I love uh, your comment on us moving away from the whole zero-sum game scenario, which kind of seems to be the global narrative, right, between countries. (laughs) That's right. I win, you lose. You're now listening to Tokyo Wave. Yeah, and it's, it's, of course, I had all this time in the United States to see how the campaigning has played out. And when I lived in New Hampshire, my first job, once I was done with uh, USIA and the State Department, I lived in a small town, Henniker, New Hampshire, the only Henniker on earth which it isn't, but <laughs> New England College. And we we were spoiled by all the presidential candidates there. But it's, you know, that kind of small 
town, retail politics, the idea you go kick the tires, you go down to the local uh, pharmacy and maybe meet a presidential candidate buying a cup of coffee, that has really gone away. I mean, I can still remember advocating for McCain-Feingold bill to reduce the amount of money in politics because I also I wore two hats in New Hampshire. I was a political science professor but I also headed up Common Cause of New Hampshire. And um, it's affiliated with the national organization in Washington. And at that time, 20 years ago, we were really trying to curtail the length of campaigning because it seems like in the United States, these, these campaigns, they go on for a year and a half, certainly during presidential runs, And they have to raise, they're getting into almost like billions of dollars and it makes so much money for the commercial media. But what do we really gain from that? I mean, we we should really shorten these campaigns like they do in a lot of other countries in Europe. And and, uh, I don't see us going in that direction, but it, it becomes a sort of white noise in the background. And over time, when you're you're just inundated with this carpet bombing of these political ads. It, it just, it's such a turnoff because they're really appealing to extreme wings uh, of their respective parties. So it makes it even difficult for us to engage in civic dialogue. And I'm, I'm an old kind of Ralph Nader fan. I've been on, been at uh, conferences with him and been on a few panels where he's spoken and he was really big about this getting the money out of politics and and increasing civic education in the United States and um, we we really have a long way to go there and so I I I was very discouraged whatever happens with the election and I I do believe there will be a turnover at the the executive office but I don't think that's going to change the the way that we go about the whole business of politics, it will just put a different party in, in power. Well, you know, it's a obvious statement, but coronavirus is controlling the global media narrative right now. And it's most certainly controlling the domestic narrative in any country, especially of course, I think we're the most familiar with the narratives in the United States and Japan, but Obviously, beyond that, there's also a global narrative of, you know, what countries are benefiting or what countries are being held back by the pandemic. And a question for you is, do you think there are any particular nations who have benefited from the pandemic? And also, are there countries who have been particularly stricken by the pandemic? Mm, that's <laughs> well, there have been it, it has come in waves, so it really depends. I mean, you could look at a country like Sweden. We what we did, we were looking for model nations and trying to get tips on, well, could we apply this to our own country? So Sweden became this successful country. Early on, Italy, of course, was having terrible outbreak and uh but Sweden went about it a different way. They didn't really, they never had a lockdown. They, they sort of continued their life as normal. It's such a small country, though, that it can't really be applicable to other places. And then depending on the leadership in place, you have um, uh, the Jacinda Ardern, uh, the prime minister of New Zealand, getting a lot of attention not only for her daily press briefings, but she she came across as very much in charge. And yes, oh, by the way, she's a woman. So that kind of sparked some interest in, well, are women leaders maybe a little bit more adept at handling <laughs> uh, a global pandemic? So it it's hard to kind of pick a country today. You could say, I mean, in the early days in in the United States, all of the rhetoric that, that that was being directed at China, you know, the China virus, the Wuhan virus, and it continues in some circles. But 
China is a success story. I mean, when you look at it now, as far as their handling of the pandemic. Now, could other countries have the kind of lockdown of a Wuhan that China could do? I don't think so. I mean, it, it takes that type of system, a very authoritative system. But it really just depends on the progress that's made. It's just very difficult. It's like I said earlier, the political rhetoric now is this always pointing the finger, scapegoating. It, it's some other dude's fault, you know, or it's this country's fault. And so we're not thinking in terms of landscape. We're thinking we're kind of spotlighting and giving credit to certain leaders and countries. And I'm guilty of it, too. I love lists of who's doing well and who's not doing well. But it also just gives you a false sense of security in that you really, you can stay in your bubble because now that I'm back in Japan, I feel like I'm in this protective bubble. But where do you go from here? I mean, what kind of life are we going to have in terms of a global economy or global travel, global tourism, international student exchange, scholar exchange? I don't know what that's going to look like. And I'd much rather see a whole international body of nations taking that on. I mean, we do have that with the United Nations and we have it in terms of international public health with the World Health Organization, but that's been politicized as you've seen it with the United States sort of pulling out the funding of it. So wherever you go, you're going to have detractors and supporters of making change and I just am going to fight hard for a certain gentility in communication and the in getting it back to public diplomacy, to use my scholarly side. We also emphasize, when I say we, my colleague at USC, Nick Cole, uh, who's my co-editor with the Rutledge Handbook of Public Diplomacy, he has written a lot about the... Um, first tenet of public diplomacy being listening and not just, you know, your ears, your listening ears, but also doing your research and being contemplative and learning from what's out there and not just reacting and uh, acting impulsively, because sometimes we make a lot of errors in judgment when we are too fast to respond to something that just gets under our skin. And so I think that listening component that we all need to work on is a good one as sort of a takeaway. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just, we got to get a good Bill Clinton. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just taking all this in. This is, this is awesome. Um, and I have met Bill Clinton. I have the photo to prove it. Oh wow. Gosh. That's so cool. <laughs> that was actually at Fulbright's funeral at the National Cathedral. 1995. So that was the one time I met Bill Clinton. Very cool. Um, so Nancy, uh, you have this extensive career as an educator as well. Um, what kind of advice would you give to students, uh, maybe some of our listeners looking to follow in your footsteps in the realms of public diplomacy, nation branding? Well, I would say that it's hard to, <laughs> I've, I've taken, sort of strange footsteps and that I've always done what I wanted to do. I mean, in, in the academic arena, you often have this trajectory and you have to sort of narrow cast yourself. But my first rule has always been enjoy what you're doing. And when you stop enjoying it, you know, move on to the next thing. And I've spent time in many places, but I think I would tell a young person to really find something that they can really grab onto. And if they want to develop a concept or do research that is under-researched out there in public diplomacy, we have a lot of holes to fill. One of them that I'm filling or trying to here is based on my observation from living in Japan and noticing that 
so many young Japanese women from high school and college were involved in study abroad. And not to say there weren't young men, but when you look at the statistics, and I've talked to the people who follow the exchange demographics, it's 60 to 70% female. So from that, I started to talk about gender diplomacy because the face of the Japanese woman, you know, representing Japan overseas, it's really changing the impression that people might have otherwise of a typical Japanese woman. And um, we're now doing research, a Japanese uh, cohort of mine, Kumiko Nomoto at Kyoto Gaidai, where we're going to interview some of these returnees who have gone on to do executive work and then some who are just newly returned and still in college to see what did they gain from that. Because our working theory is that they become liberated. Many of them are able to develop bilingual skills or even trilingual. And it's a little hard for them to then return to Japan and figure out where are they going to fit in here. And I think that it has some regional uh, relationship too. I, I've noted the same type of pattern in South Korea as well, where I've done some work in public diplomacy. And um, so I try to, as an academic, even though I've, you know, I'm rather senior in my field now, Never stop learning is my motto. It's just you, you've got to continue to have a sense of movement, that you are learning something new every day because that keeps your mind so active. And the other thing that, that as I said earlier, is to, to have that passion for what you do and just enjoy it and don't get bogged down. Um, but it, the a lot of the young people I talk to, they're very uncertain about the future and there's anxiety. And so it, it's, it's tough. I can, I can sense from them. I've been teaching for 25 years. I've seen a lot of changes in young people over that time. I've gotten older, but they've all stayed the same age and, um, damn kids, <laughs> <laughs> but they keep me young though. But it's, uh, you know, the the social media and all of this what I said earlier about connecting online, you can overdo it. There are addictive aspects to all of this. And so you've got to strike that balance and figure out where you can make some change and some change for the better. Um, there's just so much vitriol and negativity that you have to overcome. But um, that's why don't spend time in that area because it'll just bring you down. It's like gravity pulls. Well, it's interesting. You're talking about the growing role of women in public diplomacy and also how the study abroad is a large source of information about people from other countries. And of course, with Japan, as you said, the majority of study abroad students are female. And also, I know you've written extensively about womenomics. Looking at it now in the post-Abe era, do you think it was a success or was it bullshit? And also, what are your expectations for Prime Minister Suga in this area now that he has taken the torch? Oh, gosh. I just wrote about this yesterday because uh, it it's a little case study, a short case study for a book on nation branding by Keith Denny. And I spent a lot of time on womenomics because it was it was so sad to me that the latest index from the World Economic Forum on the, the gender gap report that came out in December 2019, so pre-COVID, which has only made matters worse for, for many women for the in terms of gender equality, it placed Japan at its lowest. It, it was going in the wrong direction. So over the years of the womenomics, there's been all of this rhetoric and all these women's conferences, and I've been to plenty of them. But what did it really do? And I think the 
the challenge in Japan is that you don't have enough the role modeling. You don't have the numbers in place. And we can talk about whether or not you should have enforced quotas. That's always debated. But it's very difficult for women here to picture themselves in the political arena. I think it's 10% representation. And so Japan really fails given its its power in the world is a, a super economic power, cultural power, the most literate, highly educated populace amongst the, the highest in the world. It fails in comparison to some countries where you would imagine women would not be faring well at all, but they have more representation in politics and in the private sector. So this is a head scratcher for me. But I know that Abe, he, he did pay lip service to it. And I, I, who am I to question his genuine commitment to it? I, I thought it was good to put it out there. And I've always said, related to gender diplomacy, I wrote a piece about this for the Japan Times years ago, but it was that Japan should take the lead in gender diplomacy and acknowledge where it has failed in all of these areas because... If it can improve a little bit, that will be a big win. That will grab headlines. But I think you you gain credibility by saying, hey, yeah, we haven't been doing as well as we could. It, it's it's kind of like, you know, remember the old uh, New York City mayor, Ed Koch? He'd go around, he'd say, how am I doing? How am I doing? You know, <laughs> he would get this immediate sort of focus group, public opinion poll. And I wish that... I could talk to the former Prime Minister Abe or the new uh, Prime Minister Suga and just say, you ought to be out there on the forefront and, and acknowledge this. This isn't just numbers. It's not just ranking, but really engage with men and women, because this is also the, the whole proverbial work-life balance as well. So women carry the heavy lifting with housework here. And we've got all the figures in place to show there's a problem. <laughs> but it's it's more than that. It's also something in, in the psyche. And so I always try to talk to my Japanese women friends and, and male friends too, or my students, and, and engage on this because I'm still trying to figure it out either. But it shouldn't be happening. Because you know, it's a, an underutilized resource. It's a, a really good point. And I think something that not just Japan, but a lot of major developed countries have a really hard time with. Because I think, especially a country like Japan, the third world, just the third world's largest economy, they just have a tendency to say, move along, nothing to say here. <laughs> <laughs> and right. they really don't want to admit <laughs> problems and issues facing their domestic situation. Of course, the lack of women advancement in business and lack of representation in politics. I mean, everybody knows it's like the elephant in the room. <laughs> we all see the elephant. Yeah. And there again, it's to my point, when you have the head in the sand syndrome, you you're then going to bring more attention to it because a lot of the international reporters who pass through Japan, they get really focused on this issue amongst other challenges. They write about it, then the government sort of resents that. Oh, you're just <laughs> pointing out the negative when there's so much positive. Remember the diamond princess? Yes, I do. <laughs> the, the, the government the government of Japan literally lobbying, what was it, the World Health Organization to separate the numbers. Yes. Because no, 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 that's not the number of cases for Japan. That's that boat. It's next to Japan. It's parked <laughs> Next to Japan. We haven't <laughs> let them in yet. Not our numbers. That you was, know, it actually worked, though. That, it did, that it did. advocacy, yeah. it really did work. They were able to de-link de the two. And, and uh, yeah, from again, from the United States on the outside looking in, it looked like a PR debacle to me at the time because 
it it came across as this indifference to the plight of these people aboard this you know floating petri dish that was the diamond princess now in the end uh you know, it worked out. I think the princess finally left uh, it did. in I May. Think in May or... We reported on it actually, <laughs> and you know, it's uh, they always say hindsight is twenty twenty, and I think that this year has been a really big barometer for that. And we are seeing that a lot of the countries that had this COVID problem first seem to have been, ironically, the ones who dealt with it best. Well, yes. And, And, you know, I I think I've mentioned this before on this program, but I think the Diamond Princess saved Japan from having a worse pandemic because it taught the government very quickly, trial by fire, that this COVID thing was serious business. That's an excellent point. I agree with you. I I do think it really helped Japan immensely because they, they had a, you know, high learning curve there an early learning curve guys this this might have been part of their plan all along i mean yeah. hey <laughs> you've got a corona <laughs> boat bringing your nation with <laughs> pandemic love I, I can just imagine the government officials all together wait wait we've got a cage of people off the shore of our country and we've got this pandemic and we can just Feed them all LSD. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see what happens. And remember, they were sort of YouTubing because they still had their Wi-Fi on board. So I think the Japanese government really hated that. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. right. I I will never forget the big bed sheet with like, it's Sharpie. Bring whiskey. (laughs) (laughs) I hope that guy's okay. (laughs) Oh, man. I almost, I almost sent him a bottle of whiskey. I I didn't, I didn't pull the trigger because I, I thought it would just get sent back, but... I you know, really wanted to. <laughs> I wanted to say one more thing about the whole womenomics, and that is that, like I said, with the lack of role models, at the women's conferences, which I attended a lot during my Abe fellowship years, um, there were often the same kind of super women who would speak, either from the diet or from industry, and then there'd be hundreds of everyday Japanese women who were not on the stage, but they would queue up afterwards and have pictures taken. And it just, it creates this sort of, well, you know, we made it, but it's, it's a very big leap to that stage. And so that's where you need people in between sort of mapping out, doing training and really giving these women beyond just kind of going crazy over the superstars, a sense of where they might want to go. Cause some of them are not going to want to be CEOs. And I think that was another limitation of womenomics is that it put a lot of the spotlight on tippy top and that that's just not where a lot of men and women want to be. They mm. they might want to have a very satisfactory mid career or middle manager position. They can still be leaders in their own right. You can be a leader in your own right, doing uh, everyday labor. I mean, I've seen it. That kind of attention to detail and that focus on excellence. That's role modeling. So we shouldn't make it so elite. It just came across as very elite. I remember one year at the uh, World Assembly of Women, they bring in people from all over, and then Ambassador Kennedy spoke there. And again, these are sort of unattainable Mm, It's sort of the Davos syndrome. You know, you you put certain people on too much of a pedestal, and it makes it look even more difficult, even artificially difficult to attain any sort of power or influence. Yeah, it's like women idol, you know, instead of American <laughs> idol. And it it's it can be in the end it can be so off-putting that it can sort of l- let you down because after you have that high of being at the conference, where do you go from there? There's not a whole lot of follow-up. I mean, I love going and exchanging meishi and meeting people. So I love the social aspect to it, but I wasn't feeling that same sense of striving as 
I knew a lot of those Japanese women were sensing because they're your population. These are the ones trying to figure it out. So I think having some uh, follow-ups with them is so important. That's where the research comes in and the listening aspects to the diplomacy side of this. Definitely. You know, I want to switch gears to the lighter side of things. Of course, you've spent extensive time in Washington, D.C., California, Syracuse, and also I Tokyo. I could do stand-up on Washington, D.C. You know, uh, I know you must have some ridiculous stories that n- no one would ever believe. Do you have any funny anecdotes to share with us today? Well, I don't want to start dropping names unless you really push me to it. But you know, I know Ariana Huffington, right? And I, I may have to do my Ariana voice, but I will say this. One of the perks of being a university professor is that you're very non-threatening. So when you reach out to somebody, and in this case, I sent her an email and I wanted to write about her from my friend's magazine, Becoming a Woman of Vision or something. And, and again, this is right before the New Hampshire primary in 2000 when John McCain, uh, you know, had his big run. And so I emailed her, introduced myself, and then I went out for a while. And this is when we still had answering machines. So I came back and the red light was... Uh, pulsating and I hit play and I heard, Nancy, this is Ariana Huffington. I'm coming to New Hampshire. We have to meet. (laughs) 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 And so, (laughs) so from that, talk about snowballing. I, within a year, I was living in Southern California and her life was so large. It led to the Huffington Post But I got invited to her home in Brentwood and she would have all these salons and I would open the door and it might be Warren Beatty or one day it was uh, Marla Maples and a very young five or six year old Tiffany Trump. (laughs) <laughs> oh wow! Um, they they would have Larry King and Larry Flint and Ad Asner, and it was just craziness. But what the you know, I found a lot of these people pretty easy to talk to. But the one person that I didn't have good skin with, surprisingly, was Shirley MacLaine, and it may have been the way I spoke to her because she grew up in Richmond. Virginia. They're from Virginia. And so um, I may have said to her being too casual, hey, Shirley, I'm from Richmond, too. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember I got kind of a cold shoulder. I mean, she's a superstar, you know, old Hollywood with the Rat Pack and everything. But She didn't want to recall those memories on the tobacco plantation, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, I I have a lot of stories about living in L.A. and Southern California, because once you what I what I found out is that the industry there is to go into entertainment. So to the entertainment actors, they were fascinated by meeting academics, whereas in Washington, D.C., You know, PhDs, I think it has the highest per capita number of PhDs in D.C. So it's no big deal to be an academic there. But you're sort of a rock star to a lot of these entertainers in Hollywood. And the uh, the actor who was in Shawshank Redemption, was it James Whitmore? I'm trying to think he had the he was like a Shakespearean trained actor. And I remember the ACLU was having a fundraiser. And he introduced me at the fundraiser and he said, I know that we are so self-important about all the work that we do, but this next woman, she is involved in the most important industry of our time. And that is the ability to communicate, you know, as a communications professor, but I wish I could have been like I want filming a that introduction. That sounds cool. <laughs> I just, I just stood there and I thought, you know, take this in because this will never happen again. I mean, this is a real one-off. It was just so unusual and out there. Well, I guess you go to Hollywood and you get Hollywood. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. 
Well, and Cal State Fullerton is right next to Disneyland, so uh, in North Orange County. But I moved to California from New Hampshire because, speaking of advocacy, I tell everybody, if you have a chance, live in California at some point, because it's a little bit like going abroad. And it was for me coming from the Deep South where we didn't have all the diversity, at least in my world growing up. So California's like really no other place. So from there, you know, eventually I got to Japan. You know, that's really interesting. And I think a lot of Japanese people gravitate towards the West Coast. And Mm. to be honest, not a bad choice. (laughs) For sure. Yeah. It's funny you talk about how... um, you were, you were a rock star in, uh, in LA, uh, because of your academic background. It reminds me of like when Bruce Lee went to LA, right? It's like, they're all thirsty for this more like philosophical, you know, more academic, um, uh, oriented kind of, uh, people and because they don't have a lot of that maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. You know, I think it's yeah, uh, right. what is it? You always you always want the unobtainable, and I guess if you're uh, a famous entertainer, I mean, you're not going to go back to school. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> <you know>? yeah. <laughs> yeah, it really surprised me. I I didn't think there was going to be that aspect. The other thing that made me a bit of a novelty in Southern California was that I was a Southerner, and so for many of the people I came across, they had never been to the South. Um, but they had some really strong opinions about the South and not wanting to go there. It's too conservative. It's too racist, too Christian, whatever it may be. I can't get my soy lattes. (laughs) (laughs) But I, you know, when I would hear these remarks, my retort was often, oh, when were you there the last time? Because I sort of knew that they had probably never been to the South. And you know, warts and all to go back to Murrow. He was very big on that when he was serving under Kennedy during the, uh, of course, Kennedy assassinated in November 63, but in 64, we get the passing of the civil rights bill. And so Murrow was, uh, his idea for U.S. public diplomacy in the world was to kind of air the dirty laundry, to share with the world so that the Soviet Union wouldn't be able to use that against us. So he mm. was very big on showing the the redlining going on and how difficult it was for a lot of African Americans to find housing and that we were really struggling with this equality in our society, but better for us to talk about it than to have it directed by those we know who are going to find the worst examples. You know, that really sounds like a lesson both for Japan and the United States right now is that, you know, airing that dirty laundry yourself, because there's another big country these days. Uh, It's not Russia anymore, but it's China. And, you know, if you don't air your own dirty laundry, other people will do it for you and they're going to be nastier about it. Much nastier. Well, both domestically and globally, of course. And, you know, speaking of study abroad, so I didn't get the opportunity to go live faculty in residence at Schwartzman College at Tsinghua. And I've been affiliated with Tsinghua in Beijing since 07. Um, but I, just like I said about California, I would tell people if they get a chance when we can have this more free movement to, uh, visit China, the people's Republic of China. And, uh, there's so many Chinese students who have been seeking education outside of China and they return, but we need a lot more people to go to China and see for themselves. And it is a, Of course, we could talk endlessly about the problems and the different system. I don't think the system's going to go away anytime soon. If anything, it's become even more strict, of course, under Xi's leadership. But that doesn't take away, though, from that person-to-person interaction. I have some wonderful Chinese colleagues um, at the university, and they're very open with their criticism. And even at Tsinghua University, there was a professor there who's been quite critical of the government. It's not easy to do by any means. It's not easy for a lot of academics to do, uh, but especially in China. So 
the idea of the Schwartzman Scholars Program, it's modeled on the Rhodes Scholars, and it's it's to help the country move forward by bringing international students from around the world. So I love the idea of it in principle, uh, but you know we have a we have a long way to go. But the, I I still emphasize dialogue and and really keeping the lines of communication open. And one thing that could come from this change in leadership in Washington next month, if it happens, um, that is that we could see a revitalized State Department, too, because uh, I've been really discouraged by the uh, leadership of uh, Pompeo, uh, who's, who's not a diplomat. I mean, a lot of times the person who becomes a secretary of state is not necessarily a career diplomat, but in terms of kind of hijacking U.S. foreign policy, because I'm a big believer that you've got to have a very good apparatus architecture in place for that. And there are really highly educated diplomats coming out of Japan and countries all over the world. They're some of the best educated people speaking multiple languages. And you need those people out there as your uh, communicators and uh, translators, synthesizers of this back and forth communication and not just put it in the hands of one person who's going to direct the show. No, I love those. I love those comments. And uh, personally speaking, pre-COVID, I, I was supposed to uh, do a, a monthly China trip. Huh. Um, but wow. and I know like ev- even with all the current negative rhetoric, Um, personally, I I actually, I want the crazy adventure. Yeah. Um, (laughs) so, you know, when, when things, uh, with coronavirus cool down, I'd love to venture out there. Um, you know, we're we're right next to it here in Japan. So, yeah, it seems so close yet so far away. Well, I, I think we're going to wrap up our episode here today, but Dr. Snow, thank you so much for joining us today on Tokyo wave and sharing your insights. I think, uh, we have all gotten a lot smarter as a result. <laughs> Absolutely. Except for me, I'm still stupid. But <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for getting me out of my very small Tokyo apartment. And where congratulations. I will quickly for, return to it. <laughs> yes. Congratulations for completing your 14 day quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> Cue the applause. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, listeners, that's right. You, you listener right there. Today's special guest, Dr. Snow, would like to invite you to join the Japan News in English group on Facebook. Check it out on Facebook by searching for Japan News in English, which is moderated by Dr. Snow and her team of expert Japan News in English curators. Who do you think should be our next guest on Tokyo Wave? Let us know. Drop us a line at wave at tokyowave.jp. We hope you enjoyed Tokyo Wave. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Join us again next week on Tokyo Wave. Tokyo Wave.